Welcome everyone. I'm Danny. I work for PJ Library. I actually live in Jerusalem, so I'm super excited that you're taking this family tour of Jerusalem today. Okay, kids out there, if you've ever been to Jerusalem before, go like this. Hmm. Okay, it looks like a lot of you haven't. So let's imagine that we're all together on an airplane, flying across the ocean, landing in Israel's Ben Gurion Airport, boarding a tour bus, driving up the hills into Jerusalem, and greeting us there is just the person we'd want to show us around Jerusalem, Jonty Blackman. You know, you all get a PJ Library or PJ R work or PJ R Way book every month. And some of the authors of those books visited Israel last year and the year before, and Jonty was their guide in Israel. And now he's your guide too. Jonty, good evening. It's evening. Hi, We're, Hi right? Danny. How are you? Good. How are you? I thank God I'm doing well. Wonderful to be with you. Alrighty, guys, we are about to go on a fantastic tour of Jerusalem. And you know, when you think about it like this, for 2,000 years, the Jewish people have been thinking about going to Jerusalem. Every time after the Passover Seder, or every time at the end of the Yom Kippur service, they say, next year in Jerusalem. And the truth is, many of our parents and grandparents and their great-grandparents and their great-grandparents never ever thought they'd be so lucky that they would be able to go to Jerusalem. And the truth is, we're not exactly in an easy space now that we're all on our screens, but not actually able to travel to Jerusalem. But we are therefore going to take you there together with us. In fact, we're going to take you here where we are into Israel. Come and join us as we go on a fantastic tour of Jerusalem where you have to be the detective. And so I want you to look out for a few things as we go through the different places that we're going to go, as we're going to see the different things we're going to see. And you see there's a mystery that you have to try and work out every place that we go to. You have your cards with you that have the pictures. So try to pick out which of those pictures fit on the cards that we're going to see at every site. And at the end also, there's some Hebrew words which we're gonna try help you understand. So, any, you know, Jonty, if anybody doesn't have a card, we did send it out, but if you don't, in the chat, you can find a link to the card that has the photos that Jonty will be referring to. Absolutely, and you can either print them out or you can just use them online while we're going through. So if you're ready for this, if you're ready for a fantastic tour of trying to understand what it is that we're discovering in Jerusalem, put on your detective hats and come with us as we go. And we're going to thank Rachel for doing that, for helping us as Rachel is going, is our person looking after us, taking us from place to place. Let us go to our first site in Jerusalem. That's amazing. Oh, and wow. Hi, guys. Nice to see you there. My name's Jonti, and I'll be taking you on a tour of Jerusalem together with my friend PJ and Chavav here. Welcome. Just before we actually begin, can I show you a map where we are so that we're able to see a little bit of where we are in the land of Israel? I'm going to come and bring this down here, and maybe you can see. And if you look at the map of Israel over here, Okay. See, here's the north, and here's the south, and we're going to go all the way into the middle here. Here is Jerusalem, and that is where we are. We are going into the city of Jerusalem. Notice very close to the Dead Sea. Okay, kids, come with me. You be the detective. Well, hello and welcome. We're at the entrance of Jerusalem. 
and right behind me you can see this bridge called Calatrava Bridge. You know, in ancient times, when Jerusalem first began, 3,000 years ago, people traveled just like us, in cars, in buses, in trams. Nah, not really. But because we're in the ancient city, oh, and we've got PJ here as well. We're in the ancient city, but we I'm only gonna take you to the ancient city later. We're in the new part of the city of Jerusalem. And this new part allows, with this bridge, allows traffic to go in and out of the city, and the train to go over the road that way allowing it to be functional but if you look at it what's fascinating about it is it has an incredible shape so come with me let's take a look at the shape well let's take a look at the shape can you see what we're seeing here are you able to see that there is a it looks like a pole going all the way up into the sky and there seem to be strings pulling on it and the truth is down below, we actually have a bridge. And this is what it's holding up. Now, if you notice, the strings themselves are actually holding up the pole. You know, you can try this at home. PJ, Chobab, are you prepared to try this? If you put your feet together, stand together with perhaps somebody at home, hold hands and remember lean back slowly, carefully making sure, can you hold each other? Can you balance? because you see the balance is what's important and the way we support each other as a family is important and that is exactly what is happening here you are doing great PJ and Chobab toda, toda. thank you so very much so if you look at the actual bridge of string it's a marvel of engineering where the strings are holding the pole that is standing up and the pole is pulling in the opposite direction and all of those are allowing for the light rail to go over the bridge and allow the traffic to go under and it's called Calatrava Bridge. It's named after the architect and let me say to you like this, the architect Calatrava when he built this bridge, he built it looking like this for not just because it's engineering it makes sense but because there's a symbol here. Now if you look at the bridge and especially if you look at the strings are you able to work out perhaps what does it remind you of? What would you say if I would say strings could also be chords? Chords, strings, what do you know that has chords? That's right, a musical instrument. And you know who used to play music 3000 years ago? A young boy called David. Late on he grew up and he became King David. And King David, one of the most exciting things for him was when he had some time off, he would sit looking out over his kingdom. He would compose music. He would write music. He would play music on his harp. And as you look at the bridge of strings, it's supposed to remind you of David's harp saying to you, welcome to my city. Welcome to Jerusalem. Okay. That's it guys, so did you see the, um, the bridge itself and the harp and did you try to understand or did, were you able to even figure out before I mentioned it that the reason that the bridge looks like the way it does is because it reminds us of the harp and harp in Hebrew is kinor. Are you able to say that? Kinor. Kinor is a harp upon which David played and today is part of the, the entrance to our city. And the Hebrew word for David is David. And that's why you heard us playing the song at the end of that little video, David Melech Israel, Chai Kayam. David, the king of Israel, is alive and is eternal. So if you look at your, your, um, the picture sheet, see if you can find two pictures there that connect to the bridge and to the harp, to the kinor. If you can circle that, don't cross it out, but if you can circle that, you'll be able to see those, uh, those pictures and we'll come to that at the end. 
And now, from King David, let us go to our next stop, the Knesset. And the detective challenge that you have at the Knesset is can you find the secret message in the symbols that you see or in the words that you see? You be the, te the detective. Good luck. Let's go. Rachel, if we're able to go to our next stop, that would be fantastic. Can you see, can you see what, the, uh, what the photos were for that movie? They're circled. There you go. Right. Okay. Hi. So from the where are we? Well, look behind me. You're able to see the Knesset, Israel's parliament. It's like the equivalent of Capitol Hill. This is where the government rules from. And do you know what is outside the Knesset, Israel's parliament? PJ is about to show us. So come with me. Look at what we see here. That's right. If you look up here, we have a menorah. The menorah is the symbol of the state of Israel. And I'm not sure how you're able to see it exactly, but if you look carefully, you're able to see scenes of Jewish history all over the menorah. But you know what? The scenes of Jewish history are not as important. Absolutely, I can see you're looking at it, uh, PJ. You're looking at the words, the verse that is at the bottom of the menorah. And you know what the verse says? I'm gonna say it in Hebrew and then translate. It says, Lo b'chayil velo b'koach, it's not by my might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. And I think the message is this. You know, you probably have one like these at home. Maybe a Hanukkah, when you light over Hanukkah. When we think about that idea, it's about the spirit. That is what is going to ensure our survival. Not the power or strength, but the strength of our spirit and the way we treat each other. And you may ask, well, why is the menorah the symbol of the Jewish state? I'll tell you, because you see the menorah used to stand in the temple 2000 years ago. And so our new modern state wants to connect us to our history of 2000 years ago. And that spirit we connect to as well. And so it is through the spirit of the menorah, the symbol that we're connecting here in the modern state of Israel, just outside the Knesset, Israel's parliament. Absolutely, guys. And so as we leave, we have been here at the menorah. Are you able to just uh, look on the actual sheet and see which is the picture that is connected to the space that we've just been, to the site that we've just been? And were you able to work out really what did that word really mean? What does it mean? Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Because then that is part of the secret of Jerusalem as well. And so when you think of that, when you think of lighting the menorah, if you do so on a Hanukkah, and you think of what is the Hebrew word menorah, is the candelabra that we light, both that, that which stood in the temple so many years ago, and that which we have today, still as our festival of Hanukkah, and as our symbol of the state of Israel. So were you able to work out which was the picture that you needed to circle? Rachel, are you able to show us? There you go, that's right. And so we have three of our pictures. We still have a few more to go. So let's move on to our next stop. This you're gonna like very much because you know what, in the end of the day, sometimes those things that are delicious are the things that we love. And so let's go to our next stop where there's a lot of deliciousness that we're gonna find out. Rachel, let's go to the next stop, please. <laughs> Where is Chanti? Hi everybody, we have arrived at Shuk Machane Yehuda, the Machane Yehuda fruit market. Look around, it's bustling. The truth is, it's actually quite quiet compared to usual. But because of Corona, not so many people are coming. COVID-19 is affecting everybody. But still people are coming. Look at them coming to get all their different wares. Look at them shouting and saying to you, come and get mine. My watermelon is so much better than yours. You can get a mango for just five shekel. Come on over and come and get it. And if you can't get it right now, guys, when you're able to, come on over. Shuk Machane Yehuda, remember the name. Shuk means market. We're here in Machane Yehuda Market. Come and see what it has to offer. Ah, 
all sorts of things. Can you see the shook is the market? Look at all these beautiful vegetables and fruit that we're seeing here. We're seeing cherries that have just come out and peaches and plums and mangoes. It's delicious. Faisal over here is the is working in the store. He's a fantastic guy and he said he's prepared to help us understand how do you choose the best watermelon that you can? How do you how do you choose avatiah, the Hebrew word for avatiah, or the Hebrew word for watermelon is avatiah. What is the great secret of an avatiah? As Faisal, ma asod shel avatiah sheyesh bo ech bocharim avatiah. That's a beautiful uh, watermelon. Yeah, do you not? Tzachim li tfok al zeh ve ma ma shomim? Yeah, you have to you have to knock on it to see that the watermelon sounds just right. And if it's just right, it doesn't then it's not too much liquid inside. It's a delicious watermelon, just right, excellent to eat. Look at this Faisal Shayas. Wow, he's taking his knife. He's gonna cut through the watermelon, take off the top. Sweet, sweet, sweet watermelon. There we go. Look at that. Yeah. Absolutely beautiful. Faisal, thank you so very much. Avocado. Artichoke. Ah, tiras, my wife. Come on. Get it. Oh. All right, hello, follow me, come on in. I want to show you one of the greatest secrets here in the Machane Yehuda market. Come on into the store and just look around at what we have here. Have you ever seen anything like this? Look at what you have, all sorts of different flavors. And if you'd ask yourself, what is this made of? Let me say to you like this, have you ever eaten sesame seed? You know, sometimes you get it on the top of bread or you get it on challah. Wow. But have you ever taken a sesame seed and so, yes, squeezed it? Let me show you what they do. In the back here, wow. you put sesame seeds all the way at the top there. And it comes down into this mill. It grinds it and grinds it and grinds it. And it comes out a delicious paste. And in fact, I'm going to show you here how you can take a delicious paste and you take it underneath here. If it wasn't for Corona, I would just be taking it straight away into my mouth. But we're going to just be careful. I want you to know for sure that this is absolutely delicious here. How many flavors do you think there are here? If you just look here, do you think there are one, 10, 50, maybe even 100? Let's come a little bit closer and see what you have here. Oh, look at this. It says chocolate mukhar, the best, the most delicious chocolate. There's coconut. Oh, cookies and cream you have over there. I see whiskey. That's not only for your parents if they really, really want it. But I think, you know, one of the things that I love, pecan. Halva with roasted pecans. Oh, delicious. Hi all, we've come to a fantastic place here in Machane Yehuda, in the Shuk. Because if you look around me, this space is very, very special. The guy who started is a man called Uzi Uzieli. Strange name. He has even stranger potions. What does he do here? One of the secrets is a traditional, a traditional recipe that he's got from his mother and his grandparents all the way back in time in a place called Yemen. And the story goes that it's based on etrog. Do you know what an etrog is? A citron. It's one of the citrus fruits that we use on Sukkot. And they make all sorts of different health potions based on that. So we're going to go inside. Okay. So here is Elchanan, and he is here, part of Uzil Eli. He's going to share with us some of the secrets that we have here. Elchanan, what have you got to show us today? Ah, today we have Petro from Sukkot. You know what it's in from Sukkot? You check it with the Lula. Okay, that one is a small one. 
see the different that one that one's the Ashkenazi dog with the it's a homemade mukka with lemon but that one is a original one with the it's a only a dog from this the skin the dog we make a spray from a no how do you the freshing take off your glasses take off my glasses and uh, your feet close your eyes and mm. you like feel it that Oh, this feels good. Mm. What's this supposed to do for me, Elkanah? Charlie, you, you look younger. <laughs> do I look younger already? Oh, fantastic. I like your half face. Half my face. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Anything okay. else that you've got of uh, fantastically interesting to show us? Oh, of course. Go up here. Don't be shy, it's uh, how it's uh, normal to, to do here, and stick it in your nose. Ah. I must stick this in my nose, as if I'm going to stick it in my nose, I can't take off my mask. But if it wasn't Corona, perhaps I would stick it in my nose. What does this do for me if I put it it's in my nose? open the sinus and only pay the body. Oh, it opens the sinuses. And incredible. And this is all from an etrog. Now I ginger, man, now and then. Wow, ginger, lemon, etrog, all put together. There are some fantastic potions here. El Hanan Todagaba. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, so and so we've had a fantastic time in the shuk. Shuk is the Hebrew word for market, like all shook up. It's shuk, the market. And what did you look at when you saw in the market which was the most yummiest food that you thought you would love to eat right away? So many different things, it's hard to decide. But can you see in some of your pictures there, if you're able to see on your actual sheet, what things are from the shuk? Do you see a picture of the shuk itself? Perhaps some of the other types of things that you can buy there? And maybe even afterwards, you want to maybe draw something that you wish you could buy. Maybe you can send it to us and we'll tell you, you know what, you can actually go get this in the shuk as well. The shuk, the market. And if you think about it, do you remember some other Hebrew words that we also used in the shuk? Anyone remember? What was the Hebrew word for watermelon? Avatiach. If some of you remembered, avatiach, watermelon. And chalva was that sesame seed that we, uh, that we ate, or the paste that the dessert made out of the sesame seed. And the other one from Uzieli that made all the potions and the lotions, etrog. So our Hebrew words from the shuk, avatiach, chalva, and etrog. You can circle your pictures and let's see if you got them right. Rachel, let's see what are the circles around those pictures. There you go, the olives, the candies, and the shook itself. For our next part, we're not just gonna walk, we're actually gonna ride the train, the light rail that went over Calatrava Bridge to our next spot. So remember that bridge of strings? Let's see, where does it take us to? you know where we are look around you and try see where we are we're outside the old city walls and we're near something that rhymes with mate date gate that's right we're outside a gate and this gate has a special name this gate is called well it's not orange gate but maybe someone in your family remembers something about oranges and the land of israel what are they called? Jaffa oranges. And this is Jaffa Gate. Now you may ask me, what's an orange got to do with a gate? Well, let me tell you. About a hundred years ago, it wasn't easy to transport fruit and vegetables across the sea. It wasn't easy to have refrigeration on ships and boats. And so 
citrus, oranges were able to be exported because the skin covers it and protects it for a long time. That's why it's oranges. Jaffa Oranges, that was the name of the company. However, we actually haven't come to talk to you about oranges right here. You know what I really want to talk to you about? That's right, onions. And you may say to me, come on, Jonty, I don't understand. What are you talking about onions right here by Jaffa Gate? Well, let me ask you this. What do onions have? They have, mm, you know what? I'm gonna get the help of a friend to explain to us what do onions have and how are they connected to Jerusalem? Donkey! Thank you, Shrek. You see, Shrek knows something we're gonna learn now as well. Shrek knows that ogres are like onions and onions are like Jerusalem. What I mean, they all have layers. As you peel the layers of an onion, that's what we have to do around Jerusalem. Because you see, there were loads and loads of people who came to rule here in Jerusalem and they took it over from one group and then the next group. And every time a group took over, they built. And then another group built on top and another group built on top. And in order for us to understand the story, we need to peel away the layers of Jerusalem. Even where we're standing here, there are 2,000 year old remains underneath our feet. There are 500 year old remains, the walls that you see around us. If we just pan and look at the city of Jerusalem that you see in the distance here, this has all been built only 150 years ago. And if I want to say to you, what is the most recent layer that has been placed here? Follow me. See if you can discover what is the most recent layer that the state of Israel has placed here on Jaffa Gate. I'll give you a clue. What do all of us, or many of us, what do we have in our homes on the gates or on the doors? Do any of you have, PJ, have you found it perhaps? Do any of you have maybe, no, not dust, but what, there you go. This is a mezuzah. And here we have a mezuzah placed here by the state of Israel, here on Jaffa Gate. We've spoken about symbols, and the mezuzah is a symbol that we see on the gate of the old city. I wonder if we can find symbols in other places too. So as we go around, let's keep our eyes open to see if we can find a symbol. Do you think, PJ, do you think you're able to find a symbol now? Oh wow, look at this. Notice this symbol. This is the symbol, a lion of Judah. This is the lion, which is a symbol of Jerusalem on the back of the walls of the old city. You can see as part of that symbol. Why a lion, you may ask? A lion is a leader. A lion is powerful. A lion is the king of the animals. And a lion was the symbol of the kingdom of Judea. Judea being the kingdom in which Jerusalem was given to us by King David. So we have gone all the way back to King David with the symbol of the lion on a manhole cover in the streets of Jerusalem. Then I saw her face. Now I'm a believer. Not a trace. Out of my mind. Oh, I'm in love. Ooh, I'm a believer. I couldn't leave her if I tried. There we go, all. So we've arrived in the old city of Jerusalem. It's quite fantastic to think that all it takes is a train ride into the old city and we can go back thousands of years. Now, when we go back thousands of years, did you notice, did you pick up those symbols before we even mentioned them? The symbol of the mezuzah, which is a symbol, a Jewish symbol now on the gate of the Jaffa gate. And if you notice the symbol of the lion, that is not only on manhole covers, are you able perhaps to find a, a symbol of a lion, a picture of the lion on the picture card that you have in front of you? You see, Jerusalem is made up of all sorts of different symbols, and it's fantastic to be a part of them and to see them and to really understand them. And so as we look at the symbols, perhaps the one symbol that often is a symbol of Jewish homes is the symbol of the mezuzah, the doorpost, 
the sign that we have on the doorpost. Can you say the Hebrew word mezuzah? Fantastic. And so, if you can circle the different pictures that you found that were as part of this section of the site as we're going into the old city of Jerusalem, that would be wonderful. We'll give you a few moments, and then we're going to move on to give you the actual answers to show you which were the symbols that were found in this area. Okay, Rachel, are we able to move on to the to showing which are the symbols that were discovered here? Absolutely. The gate itself, the lion on a pole, not just on a manhole, but also the lion on, on the manhole. And if you are able to actually spend time here, hopefully very soon, I'll take you to a park and you can sit on a park bench where you'll find other symbols in the actual park bench as well. Jerusalem has many, many different symbols. And so what I want to do, though, is let's try to get to the heart of the story. You see, when we get into the old city of Jerusalem, what we're trying to find out is, well, what really happened here? And what is our Jewish connection to this place? And how did it come about? And how is it expressed in the stones that we see? So let's go to our next stop as we go into the old city, as we go towards a number of different layers, and we're going to see what it is that we discover. And as we look through there, the, the, the challenge that I want to put to you as detectives, notice some fallen stones and try see, are you able to understand why those stones were fallen, not where they used to be, but somewhere else? What happened to make them fall? Are you able to answer that before we uncover it for you? Let's go to our next stop in the old city of Jerusalem. Rachel, thank you. Hi guys, you were with me at Jaffa Gate and we were talking about onions. This isn't an onion. PJ, where's my own? Oh, there we go. And as we peel the layers off the onions, we're going to see the layers of Jerusalem. And the question is, what's the layer underneath our feet? Well, you could say it's just wooden. <laughs> wooden slats. <laughs> PJ. Or you could look around and you can see some of the older buildings that the old buildings that we have in the city of Jerusalem. Look around you, we're in the middle of an archaeological excavation. But not only are we going to see the archaeological excavation, we're actually going to go underneath this. Because remember, we're going through the layers. So come, we're going to dive underneath the layers and follow me where we're going next. Okay, well, so we have gone underground. Yes, we've actually gone through the layers, not just to the lower layer of the, say, the bottom layer of the house, but we've actually gone underground. We've gone underneath the street. And if you look between us, can you see all these bricks that we have here? What are these bricks? And it's quite narrow. What is underground in a narrow area with all these different bricks? Should I give you a clue? This is a drainage channel, meaning this is the drain that took underneath the road, took all the water and whatever needed to go underneath. And you know when this was built? 2,000 years ago. That's a long time ago. We're going through the tunnel. Let us see some interesting things in the tunnel. And let us see where is it going to take us to. We've actually come to the narrowest part of the tunnel. And you know what the trouble is? I need to go a little sideways in order to get through. So breathe in. We're on our way through the narrowest part. If you can manage this, you can manage it all. <laughs> Let's go. PJ, there you go. Sideways is good. Look where we go, guys. We were walking through a tunnel with bricks. But now if you look around, you're able to see that this is a wall that has been dug out of the mountain. And the wall itself has actually been covered with plaster. Do you know why? Because originally when they built this, this was built as a cistern, which means a place for storing water. They didn't have faucets and pipes like we have today, so they had to go collect the water. And where did that water come from? Well, if you look up here, are you able to see the hole going all the way through and even into the rock. Today, all you can see is the sunlight that is coming in. But in ancient times, they had pictures and buckets that were coming down to bring water here. And one last thing, if you just look up, can you notice? 
If you look up, can you notice that there are stones, not just the actual bricks or the, the wall of the mountain, meaning we're under layers. People who were here before us built, and there were people before them who built them underneath them, etc., etc., all the way down to the bottom. We've gone through those layers. Okay, as we continue down the, uh, through the tunnel, can you see up on the roof here? Notice these incredible bricks that look like an archway, but notice the huge brick that you've just seen here. And it's at an angle. Can you work out what that's about? If you were the detective seeing this for the first time, what would you make of it? Well, come with me, let me show you one or two other clues, and maybe you can work out what this is about. We're looking up at the ceiling again, arch, which means rounded ceiling, and then again, a big, big rock that seems to have come down, but the rock has been worked. It looks like a brick more than a rock. What is that? And here too, notice above me here, another brick that seems to be at an angle coming through the roof of this area. Follow me, let's see one, two more clues. As you climb up, notice these walls. And if you look at the walls, notice every wall, they have bricks here, every brick is rectangular. It seems to fit perfectly. Some of them are smooth, some of them are not so smooth. If you notice carefully, every so often you will find little notes in the wall. And the question is, where are we? So in order to answer that, and as you, the detective, to find out the real answer here, follow me, because we're going to go up the stairs, and we're going to go and see where it is that we will find our answer. Notice all these bricks, rectangular bricks, one on top of the other. What are these bricks doing here? Well, I'll give you a clue. They actually once belonged right up at the top of this wall that you see. Now, what is the wall that you see here? I bet you've got it now. This is the Western Wall, absolutely. In Hebrew, we call it the Kotel, the Western Wall. It was the Western Wall that held the Temple Mount, which meant the mountain upon which the Temple Building itself stood. The Temple Building stood behind us over here. But this was the Western Wall. And when the Romans came here 2,000 years ago, they destroyed the Jewish Temple. And as part of them destroying the Jewish temple, they tried to burn that which they could burn, the wood and the mud was able to burn, meaning the roofs that people used to build, they built of wood and mud. But the walls built of stone wouldn't burn. So the Romans, as part of their anger, they would push down the stones and those stones came tumbling down. And these are the stones that you're seeing in front of us. These stones used to be part of the Western Wall. They came tumbling down. And even if you look carefully at this road, are you able to notice that it's not 100% flat? The reason it is not 100% flat, because these stones came tumbling down and broke the road. And therefore, let me help you now. Why did you see certain stones at angles in the drainage channel as we were walking down the drainage channel? The answer is, those were stones that fell. And think about it like this. If it falls into a channel, if it falls into something that is hollow, it will penetrate deeper and it gets stuck. And that's what we carried, came through. For those of you who've been to the Kotel beforehand, when you look around and see what you see today, you go, it is so very different. Look, there aren't thousands of people who are here. In fact, it's not an open plaza area, but are you able to see all the different divided sections? This is because of COVID-19, unfortunately. And in an attempt to make sure that we are all protected, even those coming here to pray, you can only pray in certain capsule areas in order to be protected. But this is the area where people have come to pray for thousands of years. And this is the area too, where people will put their notes in the cracks in the wall, hoping to say, even after I, I've gone, let my prayer still be here at the wall, at the Western Wall, one of the remaining walls of the Temple Mount area. So guys, as you think to yourself, what is the heart of Jerusalem? The heart is that mountain upon which the Temple Mount, the temple used to stand, the Jewish temple used to stand 2,000 years ago. And the truth is, it's this time period of year 
that the Romans came and destroyed that temple. It was in the summer, 2,000 years ago, in the year 70. So just under 2,000 years ago. And now that we're able to get to the Kotel, to the Western Wall, on a usual year, this year it's a little bit more complicated. And if you want to go there, you have to go carefully. As you, we noticed, only a certain amount of people, and people in general have been staying away. But hopefully one day soon, you'll be able to come back You'll be able to come here and we'll be able to go together to the actual Western Wall where you'll be able to really feel the stones, feel the energy around it. And if you wish, you can write a little prayer that you can put in the stone itself. But you know what? We don't always have to wait to say a prayer or to express the wishes that we have for our families and for those around us, especially in this time. If you want to write a wish, you can write it on anything that you have at home, write it, can design it even, make it very beautiful, and you could, can put it somewhere special. And perhaps you keep it there for one day when you're going to be coming and you'll be joining us here. So when you think about that, number one, we've come, we've come to the Western world. Number two, we're detectives. So we have to try and understand what was it that was was the stones falling down. And now we've tried to explain and help you understand those stones used to be a part of the Western Wall, but were pushed down and therefore um, they fell. And the Hebrew word for the Western Wall, we said it a few times and I'd like to say it again so that you're able to express it yourself. The word, the word for Western Wall in Hebrew is Kotel. That's right, it is the Kotel. So the question that really remains, and this will be our last um, site that we'll go to and our last video that we'll join together is, well, why was the Western Wall, the Kotel, and especially the temple that used to stand, why was it built on that mountain just behind the wall? What is so special about that place that the Jewish temple used to stand there? And so we're gonna go to our next stop, but just before we do that, let's look at our picture sheet and see what are the pictures that we were able to highlight, that we were able to circle from the video that we saw. So let's take a minute and see if you can circle that. Absolutely. It's the picture of the Western Wall and an unusual one of this year, very different as you have the little capsuled area, the cordoned off areas where people were going to go to. So remember the question, why was the temple built? on that mountain just behind the Western Wall. This is PJ. So let's end off with a story that tells us why the uh, temple was built where it was built. Rachel, please take us to our next stop. One last idea I want to share with you while we're standing just in front of the Western Wall and the Temple Mount area. This idea actually takes us all the way back to where we began our touring Colour Trouble Bridge. Remember, we spoke about a relationship between two forces as you took a sibling or someone with you at home and you worked out how to lean back and see the tension between you, or rather the balancing force between you. So if we think about the story of a balancing act, I want to share one idea about relationships. You know, once upon a time, there were two brothers and each brother had a farm. The one brother though, had a wife and kids, and the other brother lived alone. And one night, the brother with the family said to himself, I feel bad. My brother's all on his own and there's no one to help him do the harvest and work. You know what? I think I'm going to take a sack of sheaves of wheat, sack of wheat, and I'm gonna take it to my brother. And so up he picked the sack of wheat and over he walked over the mountain to the other side where his brother lived. And his brother that same night had a dream and he said to himself, I'm living all alone, but I only have to feed myself. I don't need to feed a, a big family. My brother must be having a hard time. Let me take some of my crops and let me walk over the mountain to where my brother lives. And so they each did that secretly. And so it continued. And every morning when the brothers would wake up, they'd look at their sacks of sheaves and they'd realize it didn't look like they'd lost anything. It was the same as before. And they never understood what it was. And then one night, the two brothers at the same time start walking up the hill from two different directions. And they meet on the top of the hill and they hug each other and they kiss each other as they realize each of them through the kindness of their hearts has been looking after each other. And God looks down and says, 
that's what I love seeing. That's where I want my temple to be. And so according to that story, that is the reason why behind us, where you see the golden dome of the rock, it is built on the place where the Jewish temple used to stand. Because that is the holiest spot where God sees the love between each other. And for our last special treat of the day, there is nothing like ending a tour with something sweet, something soft, something that is absolutely delish. And therefore we have come to the greatest ice cream store here, just outside the old city walls of Jerusalem at Golda's Ice Cream. And look at that, the delicious ice cream that you've never tasted anything like it. I'll just end up by saying like this, not only is it delicious ice cream, but Golda was the first woman prime minister we ever had in the state of Israel, and hopefully the first of many that will be here, that will be to come. So enjoy, thank you so much. Looking forward to seeing you again. Enjoy your ice cream. Thank you so much for being with us on this tour. I'm going to just hand over to Meredith, but before I do that, let's just look at our picture uh, uh, sheet and see, are we able to work out which are the pictures that connected to this last site that we had? And are you able to remember what was the Hebrew word we said for ice cream? Glida, that's right, Glida for ice cream. And so always enjoy Glida, always enjoy ice cream, and thank you for being with us. And please, Meredith, I'll head on to you. Thanks, Janti. Thanks, PJ Kovav. This was so wonderful to be with you, to be able to go on a tour when so many of us are stuck in our homes um, and maybe didn't have a chance to take a vacation. So a lot of people have asked. We're definitely going to share a video of this where so many people, there were well over uh, 1,300 people that joined us today. And so we're going to share a video. You can find it on PJ Library, where both on Facebook and on YouTube. Um, and there was so much positive response. We hope we're going to be able to do more activities like this. And also, kids, if you remind your parents or for parents that are with your kids, this month, PJ Library is having a Refer a Friend program. We know many of you receive PJ Library books. If you don't, you can sign up at pjlibrary.org or for kids that are ages nine and older at pjrway.org. It's totally free. You get a Jewish book once a month. It's wonderful for families uh, that are raising Jewish kids or kids with uh, Judaism as part of their identity. And for every friend that you refer this month, you can enter to win so many wonderful prizes as well. We know you guys love PJ Library and we want to be able to share it with uh, so many of your friends as well. So again, Jonti, Todaraba, thank you so much. Thank you, Chovav, PJ, Danny, and thank you again to both Rachel and Jessica, our tour operators behind the scene who are helping everything run smoothly. We have, hope you have a wonderful day, a wonderful rest of the summer, and we hope to see you on some other PJ Library gatherings. Lihitraot, goodbye, everyone. Bye-bye, Lihitraot.